Hey kids, it's Mr. Fly here, hope you're well, and welcome to the very last bike news of 2022. Where the heck has this year gone? I do not know. Anyway, if you're interested in what's been going on in the world of motorcycling here in the UK for the month of December 2022, stick around and stay tuned. Okay, the last bike news of 2022. Where's the year gone? I don't know. Anyway, I've got three editions of MCN to go through. Uh, and of course, we've got some parish notices as well. Lots to tell you about uh, what's coming up on the channel in the next few months. Got a little bit of a different setup this time. I've got a different sound setup using this mic here. And I've got some different lighting. Let me, in fact, let me take a little picture. I'll show you the setup. Hang on a second. Just bear with me. I'll uh, see if I can take a picture. Here we go, like that. Bingo, there we go, I'll show you the setup. I've got some new sort of ring lighting going on. Uh, well, that sounds a bit iffy, doesn't it? But anyway, let's see if it makes any difference. See, uh, let me know what you think to the new setup, sound and lighting wise. All right, without further ado, let's crack on then with these MCNs. What's the first story that I pulled out here? It is this Royal Enfield Return to UK. So this is a story about uh, Royal Enfield's distribution network that has been looked after by a company called MotoGB since uh, they relaunched here in the UK. So it says here, Royal Enfield is coming back to the UK, cutting ties with MotoGB and establishing its own distribution network to strengthen retailer and customer relations. Royal Enfield UK Limited will now manage sales and dealer relationships from May the 1st, 2023. The move ends a nine-year partnership with Chorley-based MotoGB. Aaron Go Pal, head of Royal Enfield's European business market, said, I strongly believe there should be at least one market where we should be directly involved with dealers and customers. It helps us to get feedback quicker, helps us respond to market requirements more quickly. Uh, the new limited company will also undertake marketing, warranty service, after sales and customer care responsibilities. So uh, hopefully that's a good thing. We shall see. Um, so MotoGB are moving on from Royal Enfield anyway from May the 1st, 2023. And then we're going to have a, their own company, Royal Enfield UK, doing all that stuff, which I think includes PR. So let's see if they get in touch with me. I hope they do, because I need to ride some new Royal Enfields haven't ridden one for a while but uh, anyway hopefully that's going to uh, that's going to be good news for the future at least for us Royal Enfield fans here in the UK. Next up here just an amazing bike it's one of these incredible motorcycles here that uh, you know unreachable of course for most of us it's a Braff Superior the old British mark of course now made in France they've come out with this bike it looks absolutely cracking for me it's lots of carbon lots of bling and it's black and gold so that's always a winner as far as I'm concerned black and gold bikes always always look good this is an amazing money no object I'd have one of these puppies for sure. Anyway, let's see what it says here. Uh, cloak of off dagger. Bruff Superior lift covers on new satin black dagger roadster for 2023. Luxury V-Twin Masters Bruff Superior are expanding their road legal lineup for 2023 with a new dagger roadster revealed at this year's Milan show. It's got a 997cc V-Twin, uh, circa 101 brake horsepower. It's Euro 5 friendly and it's sandwiched in a machined titanium frame. It absolutely looks the biz, doesn't it? Well, I think it does. Obviously, matter of taste. I'd be interested to see if you think it looks the biz. Here's the kit, of course, the bit you're waiting for. It's going to be €57,417, um, excluding VAT. So adding VAT, it's going to be at least 60 grand here in the UK. So, uh, yeah, I don't think we're going to be seeing too many on the road. Uh, most of them, don't know how many of them are making, but it won't be too many, I guess. Uh, I expect we'll just end up never being ridden and in collections as pieces of art, which is a bit of a shame. But uh, my goodness, what a piece of art. It is beautiful, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, the Bruff Superior. If you find yourself with a lottery win, and you fancy buying me a gift, add that to the top of your list, will you? What an amazing motorcycle. Alrighty, next up. Three-wheeling, middleweight twin Kimco CV3 offers motorcycle performance on a car license. So... This is interesting. Let me read you what it says and then I'll pose my question. Kimco have their sights set on a slice of the intercity commuter market with their new three-wheeled CB3 scooter, a machine which can be ridden on a car license. Uh, it's got 51 brake horsepower, 550 0.4 cc parallel twin the same as they use in their ak550 maxi scooter apparently uh, it's capable of a claimed 105 miles an hour that might be a bit scary on a scooter uh, and can be locked upright at standstill for easier parking and stability at the lights uh, the CV3 offers the wheel spacing required for drivers to hop aboard without a bike licence, providing they pass their test before 2013. The 265 dry weight twist and go machine has cruise control, keyless ignition, LED lighting and a 6 inch TFT. Uh, it's very much an appliance for covering big miles and dodging the traffic, uh, but should still feel like a rocket to car drivers making the switch to three wheels. So there we go. So it's not necessarily going to apply, um, going to appeal to motorcyclists, hobbyists like you and I, but it may appeal appeal to drivers um, and I just think you know does this score over bikes like you remember we saw the Honda Nikon didn't we not Honda the Yamaha Nikon the three-wheeler which you had to have a motorcycle license for
for and didn't sell very well. It looked cool and it rode well, but it didn't sell very well. This one being available to car drivers without a bike license, I think that makes a massive difference. Do you think this is gonna sell well compared to the Nikon? That was my question for you. I think it possibly will. Uh, it's just a matter of getting the word out to car drivers, I guess. Whether you can filter on it, of course, another question. Uh, that's one of the big advantages, of course, in, of having a motorcycle. But um, it looks quite narrow. We shall see, I think it looks quite cool. I wouldn't mind a go on one, I must say. Uh, it doesn't say here how much it costs, does it? Oh, 11,999 pounds, so 12 grand for one of these. They're quite expensive, you know, if you're a car driver, you could buy like, I don't know, a, a good second-hand Fiat 500 for that sort of price, couldn't you? But uh, anyway, there we go, another three wheelers to the market. It gets more people interested in motorcycling. I'm all for it. Right, next article I pulled out here, one of these group tests, Culture Clash. Um, how does electric compare? Basically, what they've done here, it's a strange um, pairing here. What they've done is pitted the MV Augusta Turismo Veloce Lusso SCS, which is the lovely MV uh, touring type bike, uh, against the Zero DSR, which is an electric touring type bike. Now, the MV Augusta is 19,790, which is a lot of money for a bike of uh, that type because it's basically an 800cc triple, but it's a lovely motorcycle. So top of the line uh, in terms of internal combustion engine bikes of that type. Uh, the Zero comes in at 24,150, so very expensive motorcycle indeed. Um, the Zero is 247 kilograms curb weight, so pretty heavy. The MV 220 kilograms curb weight. So they've done a test basically to see how they compare. Can the um, electric motorcycle these days compete uh, on level terms with an exotic, let's face it, uh, internal combustion engine bike? Let's have a look and see what they say. This is John Ari giving his verdict. In terms of the dynamics of riding a bike, the Zero DSR X proves that electric bikes have most certainly become a viable option as they handle just as well as a petrol bike. Um, in mind, an electric bike can't yet replace the enjoyment of feeling a motor vibrate, hearing an exhaust wail, and gaining the satisfaction of changing gears at, at the right revs. Yeah, we understand that. Arguably, electric delivers a whole new range of sensations, but after a B-road blast on one, you can't help but feel the ride is a touch sterile when compared to a combustion engine, which is a shame, as in every other way, aside from range and charge time, electric now matches petrol. Now, there is the thing. So, um, John Ari is saying, even if you ignore um, charge time and range, Range, they're still not quite as enjoyable as petrol bikes to ride uh, and is ignored cost as well but uh, let's face it range charge time and cost are massive factors aren't they with these I know if you saw teapot one Bruce's um, recent ride he did on an electric bike I think he did uh, John O'Groats Land's End to see if it was viable to do long distance and it wasn't viable it took him about three days and it was an absolute nightmare um, so yeah it didn't work for him uh, I'm actually going to be borrowing I think a Zero DSR X in the near future coming up in 2023 quite soon in the new year so I'm going to give one of these a go uh, see what I think it's been a while since I rode a Zero I rode the DSR previously I was very impressed with it in terms of acceleration it had the novelty factor but once you get over the novelty factor of electric bikes I'm not sure other than in the commuter space where they make utter sense um, I'm not sure these big touring bikes make sense but I'll find out let's not draw any conclusions until I've ridden the thing I will be riding it in the new year if you've got anything specifically you'd like to know about that bike stick it down in the comments below and I'll try and make sure I include that when I do the review of the bike when I get it so there we go so not quite there, according to John Ari. I think they're not there by a country mile, uh, judging by Bruce's review, but uh, we'll see when I have a go. Alrighty, last story in here. Uh, is, is Hot New Hornet too good to be true? So this is the new Honda Hornet that we've talked about before in bike news. Uh, it's a bike that uh, when it first came out, I must say I wasn't particularly excited by it, but uh, the more I've read about it, the more I've got excited because it seems to be getting some pretty rave reviews. It's 6,999, so it's an absolute bargain. It says here, when Honda's new 6,999 CB750 Hornet uh, arrives in late January, early February uh, next year, it will be the cheapest of its closest middleweight naked rivals. And that's the thing, the pricing on this, absolutely spot on. Uh, as a first big bike, this could be a really, really good choice. Anyway, I think Neves has ridden it. Let's see what he said. Big thrills, little money. Honda's new Hornet is well built with a quality feel, as all Hondas are, of course. Its new engine is the star of the show. It's being so small and light and it's easy to manage. Again, perfect as a, as a first big bike, perhaps. It isn't perfect, but it's an honest to goodness sports naked that offers big thrills for little money, just like the original. So uh, Neves is a fan. I've seen some other reviews on YouTube as well from journalists out on the launch, uh, and they're all saying good things. Of course, they tend to always say that on launches, don't they? Find me a launch where a journalist slags off a bike. Doesn't tend to happen, does it? Um, so um, 
not drawing too many conclusions yet until I've ridden one myself, but I must say, having been not very interested in the bike to start with, I am now feeling like I should have a little word with my friends at Honda, see if I can borrow one of these and have a go on a, on a grim winter's day and see how it fares, because uh, it by all accounts, pretty good bike. All right, that's it for uh, the first paper. Oh, I forgot to ask. Did you have a good Christmas, by the way? I hope uh, I hope you didn't eat and drink too much, of course, and it's now that time. I don't know when, um, I don't know about you, but I think after Boxing Day, it's time to try and slim down a little bit. So from now on until at least New Year's Eve, I should be trying to be good and try and get back into the healthy groove. But I uh, hope you had a good Christmas and uh, looking forward to New Year. All right, on to the next paper. Oops. Do, 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 do. Here we go, right. Moto3 makeover for mid-size twin. Now this here is a CF Moto motorcycle. Again, it's a Chinese built bike, so I always get uh, hacked down whenever I mention Chinese built motorcycles, but CF Moto are one of the better ones. In fact, they make bikes for other manufacturers, for example, KTM, of which more later. Anyway, they brought out a new version uh, of their mid-size uh, twin. It says here, CF Moto have given their 800 MT Sport a racy makeover to create the 800 MT Sport R. I say it looks absolutely lovely. I think it looks a beautiful bike. Uh, using know-how gleaned from their Moto3 racing team. Uh, the bike has uprated suspension uh, and brakes, plus a pair of Pirelli Diablo Rosso 4 tyres, fitted to 17-inch rims front and rear. Uh, the dual Huan radial brakes have been swapped out to make way for Brembo units, complete with braided steel lines, so that's a, that's a great upgrade. The shock gets an Olin's replacement, so we're into proper top quality cycle parts for this. It gets a high-mounted S C project pipe, which will give it a fruity note, I'm sure. Uh, and it, I mean, I just, and the paint job as well. It just looks, it just looks lovely. I think it's a beautiful looking bike. There's no word yet on whether the bike will be sold and what the price or availability will be. So I don't know if it means sold here in the UK, because why else would they have shown the bike? But uh, anyway, the 800 MT Sport. It looks good. If CF Moto bring one here, I'd love a go on it. It's got quality cycle parts on it, and I imagine it will be priced in a competitive way. But uh, it's just that whole Chinese factor to get over again, isn't there? That for some people is a problem, uh, some people doesn't matter. I'm kind of on the fence, I of course get the human rights thing and all the rest of it, but let's face it, you can't really avoid uh, Chinese manufactured items. You know, name any electronic device, for example, it's got Chinese bits in it. And also probably most what you'd think of as, as motorcycles produced elsewhere, I bet you have Chinese parts in. So it depends where you stand on that whole thing. Personally, I think ignore China at your peril. This looks like a bike that is, is going places. It looks nice and uh, it's got some quality parts on it now. Again, interested in your views down below uh, on that one. Right, second story here. Ducati, do you remember in the last uh, bike news we talked about the fact that Ducati were saying that they are a premium brand, they're not gonna make an entry level bike and so on. Well, somebody here, Pete Mortimer of Lincolnshire has written in to MCN and this is their star letter uh, this month. Let's, let's uh, oh, sorry, this week, let's read it for you. With the greatest respect to Andrea Ferraresi, right, and his intentions to raise the bar of the Ducati brand, for him to state you start with other brands and then buy a Ducati is maybe a little short-sighted, even presumptuous. My concern is that Ducati will eventually lose sales by not making entry-level motorcycles. I think it would make more sense for any manufacturer to plant the brand loyalty seed as soon as possible. Yeah, understand that. By making your premium motorcycle a pipe dream, potential customers will shop elsewhere as there are plenty of alternatives. Kind of get the point you're making, Pete, but um, I, I disagree. I, I'm really pleased that Ducati is staying a premium brand. I get a bit um, um, irked when brands that are famous for certain types of cars, for example, get into different marketplaces. I know they're businesses and they're trying to make money, but in a you know, classic case, Porsche building off-road cars or even Rolls-Royce building four by fours. I think these um, premium brands should stick with what they're doing. Porsche should stay making sports cars. Rolls-Royce should stay making big luxury cars uh, and not get involved in those other markets that really they have kind of no place to be in. I know they want to make money. Um, and in some cases those have worked out okay, I know. But I like the fact that Ducati recognise they're an aspirational brand. And I like the fact that they're not going to go, um, you know, dumb down, uh, for want of a better term, um, and make it so that anyone can afford them. Uh, really interested to hear your views on this. Great letter from Pete. I understand the point, but I uh, think I disagree. I'm quite pleased that Ducati is staying a premium brand. Uh, just just because it, again, aims, it, it gives you something to aim for. There's got to be some bikes out there that are dream bikes, aren't there? And maybe Ducati are one of those. Okay, next story. Simple pleasures. Low cost, low tech and low hassle. What's not to like about these three basic bikes? Now, I'm a massive fan of simple 
low capacity machines. Now, whenever I say that, I get loads of people saying, what are you talking about? You've got a Honda Goldwing and a Ducati Panigale, uh, you're talking rubbish. Well, I've also got a Royal Enfield Interceptor. Uh, and whenever I ride these uh, sorts of bikes, I absolutely love them. Uh, of course, it all depends on what budget you've got, but it just goes to prove that if you haven't got loads and loads of money, but you still want a brand new bike, there are some options out there for you. So the bikes that MCN have come up with here to look at and compare are the Royal Enfield Hunter 350, which I haven't ridden yet, but I have ridden the Meteor 350, which has got the same engine and the classic 350 same engine I love that engine on there uh, again I need to get myself a go on the Hunter probably I've, I've missed the boat probably to get this now because everybody's ridden the Hunter but if you'd like to see me have a go on one drop a note below and I'll have a chat to Royal Enfield if I can and see if I can ride one but uh, looking at this I quite like the looks of it I'd like to have a go on one so that's the Hunter 350 I pitched against the Herald Brute 500 which I have ridden if you haven't seen my review of that I'll put a link in the corner if I can work out how to um, that's a bike again that I really enjoyed although it comes in at £7,200 so for my money a little bit on the pricey side particularly when you consider you can get that Honda Hornet we just talked about for a smidge under seven grand I think without riding it I'd definitely have rather have the Honda Hornet nothing wrong with the Brute but it's not in the same league as a brand new Honda uh, and in contrast the Royal Enfield 3899 so now almost half the price of the Herald Brute and then last but not least the MASH 250 at 3999 on the road haven't ridden the 250 I did ride a MASH 125 once I think it was a MASH no it wasn't it was the Mutt but a similar sort of bike for me I haven't ridden the MASH so I can't really draw any conclusions but let's see what let's see what MCN have said Right, this is Jim Moore, their guest tester. He's saying, rewarding and robust. Enfield's Hunter does everything better than the MASH for less money. So there we go, that's that discounted. Plus, it offers almost everything the Brute can for nearly half the cost. Uh, if you want simple charm in a package that's rewarding to ride, robust and still worth strong money after a few years, Royal Enfield residual values hold well. The Hunter 350 is the one to buy. And without having, as I say, ridden them all back to back, I tend to agree. These new... Um, brand or this this new swathe of Royal Enfields that have come out based on this single um the new 350 single engine the, the quality level seems to have upped I mean the Interceptor was was great or okay quality for the money but it wasn't as good quality as this new breed uh, if you look at for example the Himalayan that came before uh, and even the Scram 411 based on the Himalayan they're not so good quality as these bikes the 350s I don't know if they're built in a different factory different teams whatever but the quality level on these new 350 cc's seems to have really upped Royal Enfield's games and it's up there now with the best of them and they're still keeping the prices at, you know nice and low so an amazing Amazing um, effort by Royal Enfield, and yeah, I must get myself a go on the on the Hunter 350. I was a little bit quick to dismiss it. Looking at it now, I'm thinking it looks quite nice, and I'd like another go on the engine. So, yeah, let me know if you'd like to see me do that, and I'll uh, I'll have a chat with my friends at Royal Enfield see if I can get hold of one. Right, next, here we go. Uh, so this is my favourite sports motorcycle, the BMW S1000RR. It's been made even better, apparently, with some upgrades. Now, I'm not known for my sports bike prowess. I'm a bit of a rubbish rider. These sort of bikes, I can't really get anywhere near their performance, and they're really built for going on track. But the thing I loved about the S1000RR when I rode it earlier in the year, and again, I'll put a link in the corner to my review of that if you haven't seen it. The thing I loved about it, even though it's a big, hairy, full-on, professionals only need apply type bike because of the way they've done the electronics on it it's really really easy to ride you can ride it on the road it flatters your riding it makes you feel like a biking god but my goodness me is it quick so for them to have improved it uh, that is quite something let's see what they've done so for 2023 it takes another step forward with extra power as if it needed it stronger brakes new wings and more so it's got a power boost it's gone from 204 brake horsepower to 207 brake horsepower which is insane you're not going to notice that difference i suspect but uh, my goodness me power more power isn't really something i thought it needed it's got added wings apparently wings are fitted to the s1000r for the first time this coming year 2023 uh, and that uh, obviously helps for arrows on the track stops it helps keep the front wheel down that sort of thing so for some people chopsy are you watching that might not be a good thing for me who never rides above about 50 miles an hour on a sports bike it's going to make no difference whatsoever but they do look cool uh it's got fr more frame flex for easier handling apparently they put four cutouts in the cast aluminium frame to increase flex and the chassis drop geometry has changed as well uh, and it's got a new two-stage slide function apparently again i wouldn't tap into that probably uh, the s1000rr gets a lightweight lithium battery usb charging point a new wiring loom a gopro holder handy for us vloggers uh, and indeed for recording your track days i guess the nose and tail are reshaped and the screen is taller so quite a lot of um 
uh, incremental changes. In isolation, probably none of them would make you go out and buy it, but altogether, sounds good. Uh, what, have, uh, what has Nevesy said? Uh, Thanks to its upgrades, it's not only a brutally quick superbike, but one with an even bigger safety margin on the road and track, especially if you're riding on worn tyres. Uh, I guess that's due to that slew slide thing. Uh, the engine, ride and electronics are all smoother, making the easiest of all the superbikes to ride fast. Ridiculously fast, so Nevesy's a fan. Uh, the one that they tested, 24 grand just a smidge under. If you get the basic bike, 18,000 quid. So yeah, an expensive bike, but of all the sports bikes now, I love the Panigale, I always have done. Uh, I love my Panigale, the 899, the original, the shape of that is beautiful. I think now the Panigale though, although it's still an amazing bike, has got a little bit bloated. For me, if I was buying a sports bike, it would be the S1000RR. And one day, you never know, I might get one in the garage. As I say, I'm not a big sports bike person. I'm not known for it, but I absolutely love sports bikes because I love the way they look. I'm rubbish at riding them, but my goodness me, I'd love a go on the new S1000RR. So maybe that's one for the summer, perhaps. All right. Quick break for a swig of me tea, bear with me. Right, last paper before we get on to parish notices. Very important you stick around for parish notices, got some important stuff to tell you coming up. All right, first here, return of the 790 ADV. This is an interesting story from KTM that I can't quite get my head around. So do you remember, uh, KTM had the 790 Adventure, they then discontinued it because they brought out the 890 Adventure. Well, they're now gonna bring back the 790 Adventure. Very, very strange, I don't quite understand the marketing nuances behind this, why they're doing it. Uh, let's read what it says here, and then we'll have another little chat and see what you think about it. Again, it'll be interested in your comments on this one below. So it says here, uh, KTM resurrect the 790 Adventure for 2023 to be built in China by CF Moto. Remember we mentioned CF Moto earlier? If KTM are willing to let them build their bikes, they must be all right. So there we go, CF Moto are gonna make the 790 Adventure, which would imply it's gonna be a bit cheaper. Let's see. KTM are raising their dual purpose 790 Adventure from the dead uh, in 2023. This 790 disappeared from the range at the end of 2020 to make way for the more powerful 890. Uh, this bike will also remain in the lineup for 2023. So for me, having the 790 and the 890, it just seems they're too close. I don't know what the, you know, what's the difference between them. Um, it says here, significantly it will be built in China by KTM's partner CF Moto with KTM staff on the factory floor to ensure quality. Helping to meet Euro 5 are updated throttle bo bodies which produce a greener, more efficient throttle connection, a uh, new raised exhaust system with a new cat and pre-muffler, the ignition system has been tweaked, it's got a new slipper clutch, freer breathing airbox as well. It's got a raft of new electronic aids thanks to a new IMU, which is the same as the one found on the 890 Adventure. It's got lean angle sensitive traction control and ABS. There's a new, this one's a kicker. There's a new demo mode uh, that unlocks all of the electronic extras for the first 1500 kilometers before you have to put your hand in your pocket for the ones you like best. So this is that controversial thing, which I just I can't help but not like where KTM equip all the electronic extras on bikes. And then if you want them, you have to pay extra for them for them to unlock the features using software. Well, this is even worse now on this one because they're give, gonna give you the lot for the first 1500 kilometers and then some stuff's gonna stop working and you have to pay extra to use it. So what the heck is that about? Again, really interested to hear your views on that. Do you think that is a good move? This sort of subscription model, I think it's subscription with KTM where you pay a certain amount per month for, I don't know, heat your grips or whatever. I just think there's something about it that, that feels wrong. I understand why they do it. It's for manufacturing, uh, ease of manufacturing. You know, one production line just produces the same bike. Overall, they would argue probably it brings the production costs of that bike down for everybody. Uh, but they just feel something wrong about buying something uh, and then not having features that you've bought unlocked. Anyway, interested in your views on that. So there we go, talked quite a lot about that. The 790 Adventure comes back. To me, it feels like an odd move um, having it so close to the 890, especially now with these new features as well. Uh, this demo mode just freaks me out. And uh, yeah, also being built by CF Moto. So it's gonna be interesting to see how that pans out. So yeah, an interesting story that. Uh, we'll see how that, how that works. Right, next up, quick as lightning, uh, electric bikes, as we know, are here to stay, whether we like it or not. Uh, and this is a really interesting story because one of the big downsides of electric bikes is how long they take to charge. Well, this company has come up with a bit of a breakthrough, apparently. So it says here, pioneering battery innovation company Enovate have announced a partnership with Lightning Motorcycles to equip their 150 mile an hour strike carbon sports bike with new advanced lithium iron cells, which could revolutionize charge times. Picture the bike here, looks just like a Triumph Daytona, doesn't it? It's a lovely looking bike. Uh, Lightning have integrated a 24 kilowatt battery pack with XFC technology apparently, resulting in charge time of less than, and this here we go, less than 10 minutes for 135 miles of range. Now that is, once you get down to less than 10 minutes, you're starting to get into credible ranges, aren't you? And suddenly that whole charge time argument goes out the window. 
Uh, so charging times for similar production electric bikes can be between one and four hours. I mean, this is a step change in charging times. Enervate CEO Robert A. Rango said, for the consumer, this means that riders of electric motorcycles with Enervate technology can now ride all day alongside conventional motorcycles without being left waiting for hours at the charger. This is a great thing. So let's hope that catches on. Let's hope, I mean, it sounds a bit too good to be true. That I don't know what the catch is, whether it's cost or difficult to produce or whatever. There's bound to be some sort of catch, but uh, 10 minutes to charge, I'm all for that. Let's get that in more electric bikes. Okay, next up, practical magic. Motorcycle, super scooter, or electric scoot. Which one is really the most practical everyday option? We go commuting to find out. So this is again, one of these interesting tests where uh, MCN pit some different types of bikes against each other. So an internal combustion engine scooter, which is the Yamaha T-Max Tech-Max. I've got a review of that coming up soon, by the way. I love that bike coming up in the next month or so. Um, the BMW C04, which is like an electric futuristic scooter, haven't ridden that. And the Honda NC750X, uh, the DCT version, which is a great practical bike. If you remember, it's the one that's got the storage under the under the tank. Uh, and with the DCT gearbox, excellent around town as well. I really love the NC750 as a commuter. Uh, I think I've got a review knocking around. If you haven't seen that, go and have a look. I'll put a link to that one as well. Let's see what uh, Neavesy said. Uh, he says, are you after a new bike to use as a practical everyday transport with a bit of weekend riding thrown in for good measure. Uh, if so, then we recommend you can't go far wrong with a Honda NT750 XDCT or a maxi scooter like Yamaha's T-Max DCT. And then they compare them. So the verdict, uh, here we go. So practical, but is it fun? The Honda is the most practical here. It's simple to ride, more frugal than the T-Max, less hassle to manage than the BMW and cheap to buy. So there we go. Uh, not a great surprise, I guess. Well, maybe it is because I like the T-Max, but also like the NC750. Uh, and if I was to have one or the other and I can only have one bike, I would probably go for the NC750 just because it just looks a bit cooler, I think, because it looks a bit more motorcycle-like. But it has all the practicality of the scooter in that it's got big storage under where the tank should be, so it's the same there. Uh, it's twist and go because the DCT, so it's just as easy to ride as the scooter. Not only that, it is considerably cheaper. The NC750 comes in at 8,679 with DCT. What a bargain against the T-Max Tech Max at 12,700. The BMW, the CEO for the futuristic-looking scooter, doesn't really get a look in, they only give it two stars, whereas the Honda gets four and the Yamaha gets three. So quite a decisive win for once for the Honda there on that group test. All right, last story then for this bike news until we get onto uh, parish notices. And I just want to say what a great article this was. This is my pals uh, Henry Cole and Co, uh, together with Alan Milliard and uh, Guy Willison. Um, as you know, these guys make the TV programs, the motorbike show, as well as others. I won't go into the details of the, of the um, article here other than to say it's a great read they're a great bunch of lads uh, i really like these three i've never met a guy actually i must put that right he seems like my sort of fella but i've uh, met henry a couple of times lovely guy and uh, alan too what a top fella uh, so really great article uh, i mean i do these um, mcn reviews and people say oh it's great that you do these because i don't get mcn or whatever but if you are in the uk and you can get mcn i just literally scratch the surface on my bike news here so uh, get yourself a subscription it doesn't cost a lot of money and you'll keep yourself bang up to date with everything that's going on in the world of motorcycles all right, that's it for the paper review, which means... It's time to move on to Parish Notices, which is quite an important one, because a few things going on, a few changes at the channel to let you know of. So, first off, uh, I've got to tell you that from uh, the new year, from the first video in January, I've got a new sponsor on board. It's a company called Sizap. Don't know if you've heard of them before, but they make uh, bike trackers. Now, I've used various types of bike trackers in the past. Um, I've used cheap ones, I've used expensive ones, but the Sizap one, for me, is an absolute winner. I won't say too much about it, uh, other than um, they're coming on board as a sponsor, so you'll start to see their logo, and you will have seen it on one or two videos already. You'll start to see their logo on the front and end of my uh, videos. That's why they're now sponsoring the channel, and I will be um, bringing you a video about exactly what Sizap uh, does as well. So stay tuned for that. So that's the first thing. Next thing I want to say is, and this may be good or bad news to you, depending on your viewpoint, I've got a new tour coming soon in the new year. I won't tell you where it is yet, uh, but what I am going to do is something slightly different to what I did with that uh, Alaska, US, Pacific North, 
northwest uh, tour I did uh, because with that I just ran it one after the other for 23 odd episodes and although some of you love my tours and about 17,000 of you watched all of them and, and gave me some great comments so thank you to you guys for watching that tour I also got a lot of comments from people saying oh when you're going back to doing bike reviews I can't stand these tours I can't stand watching your holiday videos so understand that so um, you can't keep everybody happy all the time can you and I love doing the tour videos uh, at the end of the day I ride bikes because I like going places on them so I'm going to continue to do tour videos but I appreciate not everybody loves them. So with this new tour, I'm going to mix and match it. I'm going to do uh, one tour video, then I'll do a bike review, then I'll do a tour video, then I'll do a, I don't know, a biker scram, then I'll do a tour video. That You get the picture, so I'll alternate it. So hopefully I'll keep more people happy. So it might be that Saturday becomes tour video day, Wednesday upload becomes something else. So, so just to let you know, new tour coming up in the new year. If you're feeling bereft that the other tour had finished, then there is another one coming soon. So look out for that. Got uh, loads of stuff coming up in the next three months. Now, um, I'll tell you about that in a second uh, because Bike News is going to take a break for a couple of months. It's going to come back on the 29th of March. So loads to come between now and the 29th of March. Just taking a two-month break because I'm going to try some other things. So coming up in the next three months between now and the 29th of March, all sorts of stuff, as well as that new tour. I've got a Biker Scrand coming up soon. I've got that CISAP video I mentioned. I've got a number of classic reviews coming up. I, I always get good feedback from the classic reviews. I love to do those as well. I get to ride bikes that uh, I missed out on. I've only been riding since I've passed my test in 2012, so 10, 11 years now. Um, and there are a number of bikes that um, you know people often mention to me with great uh, affection that I never got to ride. So in my mind, anything pre-2012 is a classic uh, and I get to ride those thanks to my sponsors, Superbike Factory. So thank you to those guys. And I've got reviews coming up on the VFR 1200F, the Suzuki Intruder, and the Suzuki Bandit 650, all bikes that have been uh, requested. If you've got any particular bikes that are sort of from that era, pre-2012, uh, I can only go back about 20 years old, uh, then let me know in the comments below and uh, I'll see if I can ride one of those in a future classic review for you. But uh, people keep saying, oh, keep doing these classic reviews. Don't worry, I've no intention to stop. I love doing those and riding those bikes that I missed out on first time round. So those are coming up and there'll be some others as well. Uh, oh, I've got um, a ride, again, talking to sponsors with the Canary Motorcycles Tours. Last week I was in the Canaries, hence, well, I've got a bit of a splendid suntan going on. You know, sunglasses, mark, what have you. Um, so I've got a great video coming up. I, I rode a day with those wires out there it just reminded me how fantastic the Canary Islands are to ride. So if it's a dreary, dismal day when that video pops up in January, hopefully that's going to brighten your day. Uh, I edited that one yesterday and uh, I think it's a video you're going to enjoy. So I'm looking forward to watching that again myself. Um, I've got a review of the Triumph Tiger 1200 GT coming up. Do you remember I rode the Triumph Tiger uh, 1200, the new one earlier in the year, and I rode the road-focused one. Um, and uh, sorry, I rode the off-road-focused one. This is the road-focused one. The question is, does it suit me better? So that review is coming up. The Yamaha T-Max scooter, I mentioned that, that's coming up as well. I've got an electric bike. I haven't ridden an electric bike for ages, but this is one that I think potentially makes sense. I won't say too much more about it. It's the Maving RM1. Cool looking uh, thing. It's properly retro and futuristic at the same time. Almost sort of steampunky. But anyway, that's coming up, the Maving RM1. I've got some videos that I've been holding for a while and I cannot wait to bring to you, especially as Chops has been doing something similar recently. Uh, the BMW K1600. As you know, I'm a big fan of the Honda Goldwing. So lots of people have asked me, what do I think of the new version of the K1600? Back at the in autumn, I had a K1600 GTL for a month. I made a couple of videos about that bike, my first ride review. I've also done a comparison against the Goldwing as well. I should be fascinated to see uh, um, uh, what you think of those videos. I think they're going to do well. I really I love both bikes. So, and I've tried to be fair. You could argue I'm biased, of course, because I've got the Honda uh, and I bought the Honda this year. So clearly I looked at both bikes and, uh, well, I don't want to do a spoiler, but you see where I'm going with this. Anyway, watch the BMW K1600 videos if you like full dress tourers. Uh, what an amazing bike. I was somewhat blown away by it. Uh, plus loads more coming, some vlogs, I've got some other bits and pieces coming, as well as a new series on the channel, which is going to be, I haven't quite worked out what it's going to be called yet, but it's going to be something like your questions answered. So the questions and comments and observations that you put in the comments below from this video, Bike News, I'm going to make a video answering those because I've been watching recently uh, some other bits and pieces. So for example, Neves's um, channel where he talks about his experiences uh, riding and uh, being a bike tester for MCN. I've really enjoyed that. Uh, and he just sits in his study a bit like this, talking to the camera, answering questions that have cropped up. I thought, 
I can do that. So this is my sort of take on it. Okay, I don't have the experience and background and catalog and expertise that Nevesy has, but people often ask me questions about bikes I've ridden or my approach to stuff. Anything like that or anything that's come up in bike news, stick your comments below and I'll make a video answering those questions. So if I haven't answered your comment, don't worry. It might be because I'm going to answer it in the video. And also, if I have answered your comment, don't worry as well. It doesn't mean to say I'm not going to answer it in the video as well if it's an interesting one. So come up with your most interesting comments and questions, observations on anything and everything, stuff that you've seen in this video or other stuff that I've done, and I'll answer them and I'll make a video about that. And I'm hoping that will become a regular feature on the channel if you like those. It's kind of not in place of a live stream, but it's kind of like a live stream, but a little bit more controlled. So anyway, there's that. Uh, and my, well, the reason why I say a little more controlled is when I've tried live streams, I always have technical issues. Hopefully, by actually doing it recorded in this manner, I won't have the technical issues because I can sort of do recorded things to camera a bit like I'm doing now. All right, so that's that. Uh, and I think that's about it, I think. Yeah, that was it for um, Parish Notes. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, do have a fantastic uh, New Year celebration. Don't overdo it on Saturday. Um, it's always a bit of a funny one, isn't it, New Year? But uh, I think we're going out this year, so it's gonna be, that's going to be fun. So looking forward to that. Don't overdo it. Let's make 2023 another excellent biking year, and I cannot wait to bring you loads more videos throughout the next year. So thanks once again for watching. Thanks for all your support throughout 2022. Happy New Year, and I'll see you in the next video. Until then, this has been the Missing and Fly. Cheerio.